Well, Michael Starabin, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the Sondheim Project. My pleasure. My uh, pleasure. We're so glad to have you. So uh, just a moment ago, we learned from you that mm -hmm. you'll be orchestrating, arranging the opening number for the Tony Awards this year. That's right. Probably will have already occurred by the time people see this. Probably. Oh, well. yes. Probably. <laughs> well, that's so exciting. Um, can you maybe... Tell us a little bit. Uh, it's for James Corden to yeah. sing. It's um, it's written by Tom Kitt. I mm -hmm. believe he did the lyrics, so I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Uh, it's still in the process of changing because when we do these numbers, they go to James and uh, yeah. you know to the star, and he'll say, "Can you change it?" And then he, give me a little more here, a little less there. And then it'll go to the choreographer who'll say, all right, I need eight bars of dance music here. So it's it's not quite coming to my hands yet. It should oh, by this okay. weekend. And then I have to orchestrate it very quickly really quick. while getting more changes going on. Then we'll record it about a week before. And then wow. we'll possibly have to make more changes, which will be edited and, and cut into it. So oh, it's wow. very much a work in progress till the last moment. Yeah, very, yeah. Uh, very last minute. Yeah. Oh my goodness, because it's May 24th today. The yeah. Tony Awards are June 9th, Yes, right? yeah, I think that's wow. it. We'll record it, I think, on the 5th or the 6th. Okay, well, yeah. we can't wait mm. to tune in. That's going to be really yeah. exciting. Great. So, orchestrator seems to be one of those jobs in the music industry that requires a lot of expertise. Right. Um, it's far beyond playing just any instrument. Can you tell us kind of how you got started orchestrating and what goes mm. into that? Well, like most orchestrators, I started as a music director. Mm -hmm. um, I just enjoyed theater and had been working on musicals since I was in high school. Uh, I didn't, my family was not a big fan of the musical theater. I wasn't taken to the musical theater. I didn't know the canon as a kid. Uh, I was taught much more about classical music and the rock and roll that I was playing mm -hmm. as a kid. Um, but I always enjoyed working on it. Mm -hmm and hooked up soon when I got to the city with Bill Finn, who led me to James Lapine, who led me to Stephen. Oh. But all of this was without really knowing the canon, not even knowing that much about Stephen's work as well. Wow. Um, and coming upon this first job of Sunday in quite a state of ignorance of the tradition of musical theater, which oh, served me as a plus at the time in that like James, I wasn't coming from the tradition of how musicals were done. And Stephen at the time was looking for to try new approaches. Yeah. And to on Sunday in the park to break you know, the the road he had been traveling mm -hmm. and do things a little differently. So it was very fortunate for me. So you mentioned like how you came to meet him. Mm -hmm. um, so then for that first, that that was your first Broadway show, if I'm yes, correct, that yes. Sunday in the Park with George. So when you first heard about the piece, uh, was uh, what did you first think? Like, did you Were you able to hear it in its entirety first time? I, my first thing was not as orchestrator. Oh, okay. I had music directed March of the Falsettos mm -hmm. for James, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we went to do the workshop at Playwrights Horizons. Mm -hmm. And James said to Stephen, worked with this young kid. See if you can use him. I really like him. And so I became second, second or third string rehearsal pianist oh, wow. after both um, Paul Ford, who ended up playing the show, and Tom Fay, uh, who had done a lot of work with Gemignani also. And I um, just was in the background having to rehearse with singers occasionally, having to transpose color and light you know, on site <laughs> in rehearsals and stuff. And so it was a real challenge. It was, wow. it was hard to do. Um, and then when we did the performance of the workshop, not for the press, but just as a workshop, uh, Paul Gemignani conducted and played percussion. Paul Ford played piano. And I played synthesizer, which was pretty brand new at the time. It was yeah. 1983 yeah. or 84, that yeah. summer when we did it. Um, and they liked what I was doing on that, and James convinced oh. Stephen to offer it to me, and I actually auditioned. I oh, went wow. and orchestrated a couple of numbers for Stephen to hear. Uh, and after some notes, he approved, and I sort of, without knowing it, had leapfrogged over half the orchestrators in New York, wow. and that Jonathan had been the only one to really do most of Stephen's shows. Mm -hmm. 
and suddenly this young kid who at the time was 26, 27 was orchestrating the wow. new Sondheim show. So <laughs> it was, my ignorance stood me well that I didn't know how important a job I had just gotten. Would it yeah. have made you scared? Oh, of know? course it would have. It would have made me much more nervous. But I just knew like, oh, I have this really cool show that James <laughs> helped me get. And it's a challenge and I want to really do creative and good work for it. Yeah. But I had no idea how you really orchestrate for Broadway as opposed to off-Broadway where I had been doing my work, which was very different. How, what are those differences? The differences are the way you, the way you support the singer with sound from the instruments the way you do counterpoint, you know, the way the orchestra plays melodies against the singers. Hmm. Uh, I could be much more wild and scattered in my work before then. It had to be much more controlled. Had to, I had to be much more conscious of how it went through a sound system. Hmm. Um, with, because the pit at, at the, um, the theater was pretty much covered over. Oh. And so it was really, completely through a sound system, which I wasn't used to from smaller off-Broadway houses. So there were a bunch of things for me to le learn quickly on the spot. Hmm. Wow. So we wanted to ask you then about orchestrating Sunday in the Park and how mm -hmm. you went about doing that, uh, especially with a show where the first act is in 1880s mm -hmm. France right. and then the second right. act is in the 1980s. Right. How did that uh, figure in for you in your process? Um, well, one of the key instruments for me was the synthesizer, which was brand new and yeah. could be flexible for the 18th century. It could do harpsichords, mm. it could do little organs, um, and in this, obviously, in the you know the 1980s of the second act, it could be a flashy you know contemporary keyboard. But there was also an imagination to the design of the show, the way the costumes were textured, like the painting, and things that didn't mean I had to be strictly 19th century in that first act. Oh, yeah. It could be a little out. It, it was the imagination of the artist, so it wasn't an exact duplication. Right. The score he had written was not an exact duplication of that kind of music. Mm -hmm. He did that more in Follies, where he really went to write a 1930s yeah. mm -hmm. kind of show. But in, in, in Sunday, he was doing French, and you had a number like Beautiful, which is like, a tribute to Ravel and Debussy. Mm -hmm. But you had numbers like The Day Off that were like contemporary theater music. Yeah. And you had numbers like Color and Light that were like a, 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 a pointillistic, mm -hmm. you know, ex examination of an artist at work, which was mm -hmm. a very 20th century sound. So that, I was free to not be strictly 19th century. And as, as the lighting designer at the time said, what a gift to a musician to be able to do a show about color and light and, mm -hmm. and do all that within the orchestration. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said the same thing about as a lighting designer. So it was, mm -hmm. it was a lot of fun to do. Oh. I tried everything in my imagination I could, <laughs> some of it which had to be taken yeah. out, yeah. but it was, it was, I was free to, and the, the working process was, my general work, people say, what do they tell you before you go to work? We decide on the band. And that's about it. And then I go off and I do my job. There isn't a real discussion because there's an assumption that because I'm a theater orchestrator, I understand character, I understand what the composer is trying to do with songs. Uh -huh. So the working process is really, here's the song, here, here's the workshop, you've seen the show a couple times, do your work, and now you bring in your orchestrations and I like this, I don't like this, this gets in the way, this is great. And so there's a revision at that time, but it's pretty much, I just do what I do. Hmm. So how does your job as orchestrator shift depending on who the composer is? You've worked mm -hmm. for Tom Kitt, Stephen Flaherty, Stephen Sondheim, Bill Finn. Like, how does that? It, it really, it, it's more about that later stage of reviewing mm -hmm. what I've done. Um, mm -hmm. The exception is Tom, because Tom is also an orchestrator. And so in, in that process with Tom Kitt, it's, it's a collaboration very often. I'll oh. take oh, the cool. rhythm section he's done, I'll add strings to it. We'll rework each other's material. Mm -hmm. Occasionally in a show like uh, Freaky Friday, we split the songs. I did the, mm -hmm. the, the, the songs for the woman who was older, and he did the songs for the woman oh, who was, for the girl who was younger. Um, but 
that's a different collaboration. But mm -hmm. with everyone else, it's pretty much they expect I will do what I do, and they will have different reactions. You know, some people want the piano part closer to what it originally was. Mm -hmm. Some are some are much looser about what you do as long. But they all, as long as you don't get in the way of the lyric and the song and the storytelling, they're they're pretty much happy to let you bring yourself to it and be creative. <laughs>